Hello and welcome to the Intentional Clinician Podcast. I'm your host, Paul Krauss, Licensed Professional Counselor. In today's episode, I'm very excited to bring on Dr. Isaac Bentwich, MD, who is the translator of Gita, a timeless guide for our time. Those of you who are interested in philosophy and spirituality and how that integrates with psychology will surely enjoy this episode. Dr. Isaac Bentwich is joining me from his home in Israel. He is a longtime practitioner and teacher of yoga and meditation. Trained as a physician and a scientist, he has founded three life science technology companies leading revolutions in medicine, genomics, and environmental conservation. He is the former head of the Innovation Center at Technion, recognized as one of the top 10 innovative universities in the world. The vision and innovations that underline the companies he founded came through periods of silent meditation retreats at the foothills of the Himalayas and in the Galilee region. His path is one of reverence to the wisdom teachings that shine through different traditions and religions. The study and practice of the Gita's wisdom teachings has profoundly touched his life, and he is passionate about sharing this with others. His work on this translation of the Gita spanned 12 years. The Bhagavad Gita, often referred to as the Gita, is a 700-verse Sanskrit scripture that is part of the Hindu epic that I can't really pronounce, but Mahabha Bharata is a dialogue between a disciple and master. The disciple Indian prince Arjuna is called to fight a defensive battle against vicious family members who are out to kill him. Shaken by a moral dilemma, he seeks counsel of his teacher and friend Krishna, who is also God incarnate. With this traumatic battlefield backdrop, the master leads the prince from the worldly starting point of the prince's despondency to a captivating, brilliantly clear account of the meaning of life, the source of suffering, and the paths to happiness and self-fulfillment. We cover his translation of the Gita and so much more in this episode of The Intentional Clinician. All right, here's the interview. Welcome, Dr. Isaac Bentwich, to the show. I appreciate you coming on. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. And so I am excited to tell the listeners about the book that you published in 2019, uh, the new translation of the Gita, or also known as the Bhagavad Gita. Yes, uh, that is correct. Thank you. Um, and I'm in, I am eager to discuss uh, the Gita. I was not very familiar with it, except for kind of cultural references that I'd heard in the U.S. And then I've also been doing yoga on and off uh, since about 2001. So people had quoted... Uh, the older translations of the Bhagavad Gita, um, but your new translation is actually called Gita, a timeless guide for our time. And uh, it being an ancient Hindu scripture, I thought that was really interesting. Um, And I've enjoyed reading your thoughts that you have in the introduction, as well as some of your personal comments um, between chapters of the translation. But I would love for you to kind of fill us in about your story, uh, maybe a little bit about the background of how you got into uh, reading the Bhagavad Gita and then eventually translating it. Okay, so um, um, I'm a medical doctor by training uh, and a high-tech entrepreneur by profession. Um, and uh, I uh, and uh, yoga and meditation have been a, a, a central pillar in my life. Um, I first met the Gita. Uh, in a yoga teacher's training course uh, 30 something years back. Um, it was a month long uh, intensive uh, course uh, out in the desert in, uh, in Israel. Um, and I loved almost everything about it. The one thing I had, uh, well, the meditations, the yoga, um, and one thing that I really uh, hated w- were the daily Gita lectures. Uh, so this was uh, <laughs> my first interaction with the, the Gita. I, I, I was very much connected to uh, my Jewish roots and have a lot of uh, a, a deep connection and respect to Christianity and to other religions, but I didn't really uh, connect to this whole war thing. We'll talk about the Gita in a it's a, a overall story in a moment, but uh, the mythology, uh, etc. This uh, uh, didn't really uh, uh, capture me, and it was uh, only gradually and later that that Gita became really a big love in my life. So that was 
how I first interacted with Agita. I really uh, resonate and love the story about the fact that you first hated it when you first heard it as it, and then eventually became your love and then eventually a book that you actually published because I find oftentimes especially when I uh, when we're younger but anytime really we we come up with a judgment about something and we and we have this preconceived notion or just maybe an initial judgment and then if we sit with something long enough our opinions or our thoughts process can change about it and I've talked about this in my podcast when I first was doing a certain type of counseling, like I was working with substance abuse. I thought it was worthless and I didn't want to do any, have anything to do with it. And now I've learned that that experience has helped all of the other types of therapy I've ever uh, done and helped me help clients that had nothing to do with having any substance use issues. So I'm, I'm excited to see that how that changed for you. Um, so I do think we should um, give a little background, like you said, um, and there's plenty of things people can read on the internet about the Bhagavad Gita, but can you tell us a little bit about the background of it and what is it essentially? Sure. So, so the Gita is a, is an ancient scripture. It's a, at a, a high up there uh, next to the Bible and the Quran. Uh, it's one of the world's most uh, uh, read and most translated, uh, and most printed and translated texts uh, in the world. Uh, and uh, and it is a text that can be viewed in many different uh, ways as a historical uh, document, as a, 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 a religious. Uh, document. Um, uh, the, the, my translation uh, uh, treated it uh, as a manual for inner development, which is what I believe it really is. Um, and so, yes, uh, it, it comes from the Hindu uh, uh, tradition. Uh, yes, it is associated with yoga. Uh, yoga, uh, we all know yoga in the West, but in the West, yoga has become primarily um, uh, uh, in uh, uh, fitting with the the uh, uh, vibration and the interest of uh, of us people in the West has become something more external, getting a firm butt, getting your uh, body uh, flexible and in uh, shape, and you feel good uh, with your body when you uh, do some stretching, etc. Um, yoga is at the very uh, uh, Gita is at the very heart of the deeper and broader sense of yoga, which is uh, the totality of, of uh, paths for inner development, inner journey. Um, the text itself is a, uh, is a text that describes a dialogue between a disciple and the master. Uh, I called uh, this uh, translation Gita a timeless guide for our time because uh, it truly is a dialogue between master and disciple and more importantly between us and the inner voice of our soul, and so it is timeless. It has nothing to do with uh, a bit well beyond the, the, the historical connotations of uh, this or that uh, uh, figure. But anyway, um, a dialogue between master and disciple. The disciple is a prince, Indian prince, called Arjuna. Uh, the master is his friend, um, his charioteer, um, and God incarnate. Um, and so uh, in typical uh, Indian um, imagination, uh, here's a dialogue and an invitation. If you had the chance of having an afternoon chat with God, what would you ask? And what would God respond? Uh, where God is not some uh, uh, fearful um, bloke uh, in the sky that, that's uh, wrathful, but rather the uh, truly the inner voice of your own soul. And so it's a dialogue with you, of you, of me, of any of our listeners, uh, with the inner voice of our soul, which is the essence of life or, uh, or God. The dialogue happens in the most unlikely of settings, uh, uh, which is why I was uh, uh, put off by the, the, the text initially, and many people uh, uh, misunderstand it. Uh, it's at the um, uh, at, at the battlefield. The prince is uh, being attacked by vicious family members uh, who want him dead, um, and he's torn by the moral dilemma to fight or not to fight. Uh, 
uh, uh, being uh, being a pacifist and not wanting to uh, 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 to kill his relatives, even if they are. Uh, Uh, bad people uh, is the opening statement for the for, uh, for the uh, for the Gita. Why hold a philosophical discussion like this at the battlefield? That sounds uh, crazy, right? I mean, we were used to think of other religions or other in, uh, similar dialogues. Uh, this is uh, not uh, the amount of beatitude, uh, uh, Christ uh, uh, overlooking the Sea of Galilee. This is not Buddha under a body tree or in Sarnath with a, a, a collection of a few disciples pondering the questions of reality. This is Corona time, right? This is in the middle of a battlefield. It's you and me here and now in the world. And so that's what makes it so uh, utterly real. Uh, it, it takes us from philosophizing to philosophy uh, in the most uh, urgent and direct Uh, since when you're uh, in the uh, midst of a battlefield, it's sort of a freeze frame. They're about the battle is about to uh, to ensue. Um, the disciple asks the uh, the master, I, "What should I do?" And the master, um, and 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 then the, it sort of freezes, and the entire dialogue happens in the split frame uh, between as the battle is about to uh, to ensue. Uh, and what follows is a poetic, uh, and that's another uh, uh, striking uh, feature of the Gita. Not only is it a, 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 a discourse in the meaning of life and the search for happiness and the, the, the technique of meditation and, the, and all of that, it's a poem, 700 verse uh, poem. So uh, being a medical doctor myself, I've always thought of the Gita as sort of with the accuracy that it has, like a neurosurgeon's manual to the mind and its working, uh, and yet written in the form of a poem. Uh, and not coincidentally so, because uh, unlike our uh, culture, uh, it's basically taking us beyond intellect. And the way to do so is uh, by uh, working through art and intuition and feminine en energy uh, and poetry. And so it's a beautiful uh, 700-verse uh, poem that discusses these truths that are as relevant Uh, today as they are as they were uh, then and I dare say they're even more relevant in our here and now um, with the commotion and turmoil and difficulty on, on many levels that we're experiencing we all have our battlefields in life and so this is the uh, taking us to the analogy of, of uh, that battlefield there that is just lovely um, I it Reminds me of some of the things that you were writing in the introduction, but it's just very nice to hear you to talk about all of this. And I do, it did strike me when I start, started reading it. I, I, I thought, wait a minute, we're on a battlefield. That was actually a thought I had. I was like, what, what is this? I, I was used to, I was thinking, you know, there was gonna be some Zen poetry going on, like a Rumi poem or something, because it, you know, or, you know, like a, exactly like Christ, you know, preaching and, and whatever, but it was, uh, He was definitely in the middle about to have this battle. Um, and, and then it was interesting because a lot of the thoughts he was expressing to the master, I was thinking, well, if I was at a, about to have a battle, which I don't really want to, I would be happy. He has all these myriad of, of different reactions to it. Yeah. And then it sort of leads him into the teaching. And one of the things that struck me was you were talking about intellectualizing. So a, a large part of Western culture is we have uh, be become addicted to information and, um, and knowing things and believing things. Um, but we have, we've kind of disjointed that from the application and the experiential. So um, I think they say with one analogy of wisdom is, is knowledge applied or information utilized. And, and I found that in therapy, um, while I do different types of therapy uh, for the psychotherapists out there, uh, I find that experiential work sometimes is the most powerful and, and, and actually really interesting things come out of that. And, and yet it seems like clients 
don't often want to do that every week because it's so intensive and it, it does get them in touch with their inner, their inner part or inner soul as, as we could, uh, call it. Um, and so this, this book is obviously been around for a long time and, um, in many different translations. And I was looking through here about how many people have been reading it. And I was thinking, uh, this is like a list of my favorite people here. Um, George, my favorite Beatle, George Harrison, Leonard Cohen. I love his songs. Beethoven, of course, John Coltrane, Philip Glass. I saw him and I got to see him play a concert a couple of years ago. It was wonderful. Uh, Gandhi, Nelson Mandela, Martin Luther King, uh, Barack Obama, Deepak Chopra, Carl Jung, who is a huge... Carl Jung's name comes up a lot on this podcast. And a surprising one, Robert Oppenheimer, the father of the atomic bomb, uh, and many other people like T.S. Eliot and J.D. Salinger, uh, up to, let's just go here, Jim Carrey and Hugh Jackman, who are in who are newsworthy if you listen to popular uh, things. So this has influenced and inspired quite a lot of people and, and the entire um, kind of practice of yoga. Uh, so it's it's very obviously transformational and interesting, and it's you know what, what was it 500 BC or something like that? Yes, they, yeah. yeah. It, it, they they say 500 the BC. The the it it's actually a, a encapsulating philosophy that's 5,000 years old, uh, and uh, and um, but that's that's about the date that that has been put in in writing. So I want to enlighten our listeners on your viewpoints. Um, there, I don't know which three to go through. Yeah, there was three things that struck me in your introduction. The, the three interesting parts about your translation, and also the three points of the of the Bhagavad Gita. So um, maybe let's we'll start with how your translation is different and 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 updated in many ways. Could you speak on that? Uh, yeah, uh, look, there, there are uh, well over 200 uh, translations in English alone and then many more uh, commentaries, uh, and m- many of them are uh, excellent uh, translations. This is uh, merely my uh, offering of uh, um, uh, yet another version, uh, w- what uh, uh, apparently uh, turned out to be a, a quite unique about it is that, uh, um, and, and this was coincidental, coincidental and not intended. Uh, I've started working on it uh, uh, really uh, to stay sane in life and through the turmoils uh, of life. So it was my sadhana or my inner practice, and I fell in love with the, the verses and the, uh, and found out for myself that the, the, the way that they're written in poetic form uh, is not coincidental uh, because it is meditative. Each one of these verses, um, um, one of the uh, great uh, commentators uh, uh, refers to these 700 uh, verses as 700 pearls strung on a string, like a string of pearls, where each one is a pearl of wisdom, uh, beautiful and, and complete in its uh, own, uh, and the, and related to the pearl before it and leading to the pearl after it and yet independent on its own. And, and so uh, in my experience, I, 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 I've, I've uh, very much connected with that. Uh, they are pearls of wisdom that uh, uh, turn uh, that, that do their thing in your mind uh, as a, 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 a very loved and, and the, uh, appreciated uh, Tibetan teacher, Lama Yeshe, uh, one of the people that brought uh, Buddhist uh, Tibetan, Tibetan Buddhism to the West, that says uh, uh, when you think of mantras as something foreign, uh, don't think that this is something that, that's uh, technical or that you, you're you using mantras every day, he says. But rather than using the mantra pizza, 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 or money, 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 uh, why don't you do something more useful with your life? So And so coming back to these pearls of wisdom, uh, there are seeds of wisdom that roll around in your mind. 
Um, and so back to your question about this uh, translation, one thing that, that uh, uh, turned out to be quite uh, unique about it is that it is the first translation that captures in English the original uh, meter and rhyme of the poetic form uh, in its, uh, in, in its uh, origin, uh, while uh, attempting, as best as I could, to, uh, uh, to capture the, uh, uh, the essence of uh, this is a practical guide for inner uh, wisdom. And the third aspect, uh, so these are two uh, um, um, uh, foci of, of this uh, translation. The third is that it was written uh, uh, so that it speaks uh, equally and directly to men and women alike. I was... Uh, um, I, I've, my work on this translation spanned uh, uh, 12 years, now uh, quite a bit more than 12 years. But uh, uh, And so one of the things that struck me is that with this being such a uh, universal scripture, um, it didn't really make sense that it's all written in male form. Um, uh, this was something that maybe was uh, okay in the past, but... Uh, uh, really felt that that it should speak to men and women uh, alike, and so that was part of the uh, uh, of the the, the journey. Um, an interesting anecdote related to this uh, was uh, how I stumbled uh, my own journey with with the the translation on the poetic side. I started scribbling uh, verses because I liked them and I meditated on them and, and so forth. And uh, as I I knew nothing about the poetic. Uh, uh, um, format of the text. Out of my ignorance, I read some translations. I didn't know anything about it, but it uh, appealed to me to try and put them in, in a poetic form. And the wonderful thing is that as I was doing this, I um, gravitated towards uh, the actual meter uh, in which the scripture was originally written. Uh, out of pure ignorance, I didn't know this. Uh, four lines of eight verses uh, is... Uh, and so it's sort of the the, the scripture itself uh, drew me to uh, to the to the meter and the importance of it. And as I and so I uh, yet again started and, and translated it to that exact meter. And then I started hearing the music, uh, as it were. It, you you can actually uh, hear it when you uh, uh, will read a few verses to to give an uh, to give an example. But. Uh, 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 there's a music, there's a rhythm to it, which helps uh, practically in going beyond intellect and uh, leaving intellect behind and going into the realms of, of, uh, uh, of intuition and uh, uh, through poetry. Yes, I love that. Um, bringing it to more into the, the feminine and masculine together voice, I, I think... Um, I think is more needed now than ever. I, we in the United States and a lot of Western culture has been experiencing a renaissance of the feminine traits that we discarded while we were trying to make a quote unquote better world uh, through you know progress, whatever that is. And then, um, as this is obviously not a show on this, but uh, it, oftentimes if you grow up in the patriarchy, you don't realize that you've been told to not have emotions as a male or um, uh, don't listen to your intuition, listen to your plans, um, listen to what you want. Um, what you want is most important, not what the community wants. And and not to, not to split things, but feminine principles going back to ancient times are more concerned with the community and making sure everyone has enough to eat and um, listening to your inner voice and also what is the trade-off of progress. And um, it's ironic to me, uh, living in a Judeo-Christian dominated country, that um, Christ was actually preaching many feminine principles, uh, but they've been reinterpreted through uh, a patriarchal lens. So this is a breath of fresh air because, you know, back in the times, I don't know the, all of the history, but a lot of times in certain religions, the, the men were the spiritual teachers more. Not that that, not that there were many women, but that's a lot of that's been erased, obviously, from the history of books. But um, I'm glad that you brought that out because I do believe that we need a, a, the feminine principles brought forward more than ever. And then to unify that with the masculine principles in a Jungian type place where the males 
um, the, the male or I shouldn't say male, sorry, the masculine <laughs> prince. I'm not trying to make it gender, but I just said that because I've been programmed, sorry, but that the masculine principles um, respect and uphold the spiritual principles of the feminine in a way that actually is inclusive of everyone on the planet, all humans. Um, so I love that. At the heart of uh, the, the, all of the ancient uh, traditions is this uh, union, uh, respectful union of, of the, the two energies, the two aspects of, of who we are, the masculine and the, the feminine. Um, uh, when we sit for meditation in, in many traditions, uh, um, it, is, uh, accepted, uh, it is guided to uh, hold your uh, right uh, uh, palm within your left uh, palm. This is how the Buddha is sitting. And so this is a, a, a submitting the masculine right uh, side of our uh, body, left side of our brain, um, uh, being submitted and uh, caressed and ho- held within the confines of uh, the the, uh, the feminine uh, side uh, of us. So, uh, um, yeah, so the Gita is the ultimate. Uh, people don't uh, often know this, uh, well, sometimes don't know this. Uh, hatha yoga, um, uh, the term hatha is actually hatha, sun and moon. And so hatha and yoga is merger, and so yoga is marrying the unifying the two aspects of our being, the masculine and the uh, feminine. Um, so, um, wonderful! I love that. Um, yeah. So, I, I'm excited to get into some of the relevance for today, but I think we definitely should inform some of the uh, listeners who haven't maybe read the the Gita about some of the main points. Um, that are talked about in the Gita, um, just to kind of give an idea of what we're, how this could apply. Sure. So, so the the uh, the Gita is is a a, a, a practical guide uh, for inner development. Um, uh, it comprises eighteen chapters that are divided into three. Um, sections or three paths. Uh, the first one, the first six chapters is the path of action. The second path is the path of devotion, uh, devotion slash uh, mysticism slash intuition slash emotion. Uh, and the last path is the path of wisdom. Uh, wisdom uh, being not uh, non-intellectual uh, knowledge, non-intellectual wisdom, the wisdom that comes from transcending uh, intellect and knowing who you are. Um, and so, uh, in a nutshell, that that uh, gives an idea of, of the themes that the Gita is is dealing with. It it starts with the foundation of the uh, what I'd call the art of living life wisely. How do we uh, live our lives such that every day, every moment, every instance, uh, every uh, crisis uh, is a learning experience uh, that allows us to set the foundations for overcoming the ego? Uh, In a nutshell, that's what it's all about. All three paths uh, deal with the same thing. Uh, you uh, mentioned that in your audience, uh, there's a, a, a psychiatrist and, and a psychologist is a therapist are a, a part of the uh, in the uh, intersection between psychology and philosophy. Uh, Gita has a, is is a guiding us or. or inviting us on a on an interesting direction in western philosophy in western psychology uh ego is the centerpiece uh it is assumed to be not only very real uh but uh, that which we are serving um we want the, we want to be happy and so uh, who are we we are the ego uh gita is gradually taking us on a radically different uh, a journey, uh, starting with baby steps. This is the beauty of it. It's it's meant for me and you, not for some some sages in a mountain, not for enlightened beings, but for ordinary people like you and me, uh, taking the first baby steps, but taking them in the the right direction. And so, right direction meaning gradually uh, toning down and eventually transforming and, and going beyond ego. 
the action path starts the way by um, emphasizing how we can uh, leverage activity in the world to uh, be altruistic activity, not uh, so much self-centered, uh, being more focused in the here and now, not uh, being drawn by fears and anxieties of the futures or, uh, uh, or troubling uh, thoughts from the past, but uh, just do it as the... <laughs> It says, um, a, a second path it, it goes into the realm of mysticism and, and poetry um, to uh, really uh, in, in, encourage our intuition that sees the unity around us. Um, as we were talking, I'm, I'm uh, speaking from Israel and I'm just looking out at the setting sun on the Mediterranean. And so when we look at the setting sun or when we hear the laughter of, of the babies and the, or the, the blooming of flowers, uh, all of the emotions, the positive ones, the sad ones, uh, it steers us and uh, when we uh, are, it helps draw, draws, uh, drawing us out out of ourselves, out of this never-ending, busy story of judgment and thoughts and projections into an awe of, uh, wow, uh, there is a unity around us. There is something sacred, even if we don't know what it is, if, whether we're atheists or belonging to this religion or that uh, uh, belief, there is something there that is spirit that is not just that is the forest and not just the trees uh, that is uh, uplifting um, that is God if you want to call it uh, uh, that um, and then the third uh, uh, and so that takes the, the next uh, step and then the the last the, the, the uh, third path of the Gita path of wisdom uh, takes us further of inquiring who am I so who am I really uh, I'm obviously not this collection of uh, uh, small-minded uh, thoughts and judgments and memories. Uh, I think I am that. Uh, um, it's a challenge for therapy. I think if um, psychology has changed dramatically in the West uh, over the past 20, 30 years uh, from being very much ego-centered to uh, something that's more uh, uh, holistic, um, still, it's a radical uh, view, um, uh, understanding or the, the notion that uh, happiness can come by uh, overcoming ego altogether, um, uh, harnessing it, using it as a servant, but not being a, a slave to it as a tyrant. Uh, um, and so that's the, the third uh, notion of uh, on the Gita. There is so much richness in what you are saying and summarizing so well. I can definitely see that all this study is just percolated and made a very nice reduction for this podcast. And so, you know, these podcasts, as you know, are just a little sampler, if you will. Um, you know, if you go to a restaurant and, and all you eat is a sampler of a sandwich, you're still going to be hungry. So for the audience out there, I would say, um, one of the ways that we are transformed is through experience. And so, um, but it's never, it, it doesn't seem to be transformed in a logical ego way. You, we have to be open to experience. So for instance, um, I've been trying to dedicate my mornings to reading and stretching and playing music and different things like that. And some days, you know, just, I just did it. Okay. And I, uh, you know, and I'm deleting the social media stuff. So that's great. So I just did it instead of like listening to, to that. But other days I feel totally transformed. I have poetry, different uh, books I read and things I do. And some days something strikes me, but even further what you were, what you did and what people can do. And maybe I will do, cause I was reading, I was reading the Gita on a, vac on a little vacation. And so I was reading a lot at once which is not actually possibly, <laughs> I mean, it's a one way to do it, but you, I'm not getting everything from it, right? Um, it is a, a devotion, uh, so to speak, a devotion to a, a practice. And uh, the practice uh, that I was kind of hearing you saying was that you would read passages and meditate on them. And from that, from my experience, I, I often get many different layers. I have my first layer of, 
of thought. Maybe I have an ego reaction. Maybe I have an emotional reaction, spiritual. But if I dwell on it long enough, it starts to sink into layers that can only um, be described if you've gone there. Um, and so I would say to people out there who are, you know, just reading lots of things on the internet or just listening to podcasts and never jumping in the pool, but just putting your toe in to see how warm it is. Um, try, try an experiential practice. It can really, really transform your life as it did for you. And, um, and, and for myself, just not in one book, I'm, I'm a little bit scatterbrained when it comes to books. So, um, (laughs) I love books, but I'm always reading six of it once. So whatever that means, but that's kind of my, uh, my makeup. So, um, I wanted to talk to you about some of your comments about, uh, we were talking over email and you had talked about how relevant, uh, how the Gita could help us right now. Uh, we're in a worldwide pandemic that, uh, is continuing. We have, various financial crises, depending on what country you're in, um, but pretty much everywhere. Um, uh, Social distancing is happening to make sure that the virus is not spreading as rapidly. Um, And then in the U.S., we are uh, in quite a strange uh, situation uh, where a lot of truth is being spoken about a a long, long overdue um, about society and sort of uh, racial tension here, and uh, also lots of other things going on. We have an election here, which is going to be a great yeah. bunch of fun. I'm sure. I'm gonna. I'm sure it'll be very easy and calm for everyone involved. Um, so uh, yeah. So I, more meditation than ever. Um, uh, so I wanted to hear kind of because you're the expert on the Gita. I mean, I've done yoga and I've done some meditations and all this business, and and I love you know reading, but I. I I don't have the layer and depth of wisdom. So anything you want to talk about related to maybe a lesson that you feel that we could yeah. learn from this? Sure. Look, uh, uh, I'm not an expert on anything, uh, but uh, oh, okay. <laughs> uh, um, um, it, it really is, uh, it feels to me like a, a super timely in these confusing and difficult uh, times. Uh, uh, many uh, of us or of people close to us uh, uh, losing their jobs, the uncertainty around, their, uh, around it, uh, and that which we in the Western culture have uh, rarely get exposed to. I live in Israel, so I've been in life and death situations, but most most of us in the West, uh, you know, we take life for granted and it's pretty easy. And all of a sudden, a tiny virus out of nowhere uh, throws in, uh, everything into this uh, mayhem. And even our very life uh, is, is uh, in, uh, in danger. And so um, uh, all of a sudden, uh, out of left field, this uh, uh, scripture which starts uh, in the midst of a battlefield uh, doesn't seem so far off or uh, or irrelevant. In fact, we feel uh, um, torn by these uh, uh, questions. And, and to, to sort of address the uh, with what you're asking, let me uh, take you to the, the a few verses uh, uh, from the beginning of the um, uh, of the book, uh, the beginning of the dialogue. Uh, the uh, the prince uh, is uh, in tears. Uh, his life is in shambles, as is ours to some extent uh, right now. Um, he is confused, as we are. Um, doesn't uh, he's not facing election year, but he's facing uh, enemies out to kill him, which uh, sometimes feel frighteningly <laughs> uh, similar to to uh, 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 whatever our our political denomination may uh, be. Uh, and so I, I, I won't read the whole thing, but after a, a sort of a stump speech, as you, which you mentioned the, uh, earlier, uh, Paul, uh, of the, the, the disciple asking the master, but in doing so, being very knowledgeable and articulate and opinionated uh, on his uh, stump, we should do this, we should not do that. What is uh, what should uh, what should be done? And then uh, a grace of of the, the divine divine uh, happens and he breaks down uh, to I don't know uh, and the, he says a veil of pity routes my heart mine's dark where does my duty lay guide me master what ought I do I'm your disciple show me the way 
Uh, and so uh, uh, thus spoke the brave warrior prince, conqueror of sleep, master of will. I shall not fight, he added, and then spoke no more and was still. Then to him, between the two armies, disconsolate by these tormenting trials, the master ruler of senses spoke, wearing the, the, the faintest of smiles. And so the, uh, the, the, pe the, the prince is in shambles, crying out in his anguish, and the master's response is a smile, a thin Buddha-like smile. What are you smiling? I asked you a question. What should I do? What should I vote? What should I do? How, what, uh, how shall I cope with my work? What shall, I, what shall happen? All of these questions. And uh, the master uh, uh, is answering with a Buddha-like uh, uh, smile. And then comes the, the next few verses, which uh, give us a, a tasting. You, men you mentioned the sampling of the buffet. Uh, they give us a tasting of, of, of how this works, of these verses of wisdom. And so the master says, you speak words of wisdom, O prince, but your sorrow is in vain. For the truly wise never mourn, neither the living nor the slain. There was never a time we were not, me or you or these enemy kings, nor can there be any future in which we ever cease being. And so a uh, uh, total um, uh, pairing of uh, he's, he's sort of beginning with uh, throwing the disciple to what I call the deep end of the pool uh, of examining the most basic assumptions. You're not this body, dude, <laughs> he says, he'd say, uh, you're not, um, nor am I. Uh, what seems as a conflict rather than going into a, 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 we live in this world and we have to act in this world and we're not going to run off into any cave, but to do so effectively, let's get back to first principle um, of, uh, of who we are and, and then we can act effectively in this, uh, 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 in this uh, uh, world. I'll, I'll read just one more uh, uh, verse uh, here. Senses contacting their objects cause feelings of heat and cold, joy and pain to evince. They come and they go, they never last long. You must learn to bravely endure them, O oh Prince. And so rather than being sucked into the myriad of questions, should I do this or should I do that? Um, and all of that will come with uh, advice and then pearls of wisdom of how to act and how to uh, uh, feel and how to, like training ourselves like a, a young child learning to walk again, uh, training our hearts and minds how to uh, walk. But it, it starts from... Um, Let's observe what is, uh, what is happening. You're not the body or mind. Senses contacting their objects cause feelings of heat and cold, joy and pain to evince. They come and they go. They never last long. You must learn to bravely endure them, O oh Prince. The pandemic is a grace of God. <laughs> uh, every difficulty in life is grace. Uh, because we are under the tyranny of ego, which uh, is spellbound by this fascination of our judgment. This I like, this I don't like, this I will control, uh, as though we were the masters of the universe. What are we? Nothing. Uh, the world exists 13.8 billion years. We're here for an, uh, an instant. Uh, and so participating in this magical, not, uh, not to beautify or to, to uh, uh, smooth over, to gloss over the difficulties that, uh, and the pain that, that we're experiencing and that others are, the social duties that we have, uh, the political duties that we have and we must, the role we must play, but to do so from uh, taking a step back and from a deeper um, uh, peace within which we must find. And in that sense, uh, times of turmoil are actually a good thing. Um, very difficult, very painful, um, but they're a, a lesson brought to us to allow us to flex uh, our uh, 
muscles of the heart. Uh, if meditation, whatever form it takes in our lives, is something that remains when we're serene and everything is cool and, and, and quiet, then that's of limited uh, uh, benefit. It's uh, at times like this, that which are difficult, uh, our minds are troubled, our meditation are shot through the window, we're it's difficult to keep to keep our calm, and we should accept that. But uh, and so, uh, words of wisdom like the Gita help us through these troubling times, and and, and more than that, they help us grow um, using these troubled times as as stepping stones. Yes, I like that. Um, people, nobody I know likes to learn through suffering, but that's how most people learn everything. Because you can you can go to school or learn the right steps by watching others, um, but until you actually experience it, it's you're not sure how it's going to change you. And right now, a lot of people are suffering, and um, there's that principle that you know the darkest storm is always before the beautiful sunlight. And um, so I do think that there's something to experience, but we do need tools to get through this. And it, you know, it's so interesting how universal the Gita is because it reminded me of this passage in this Buddhist text that I'm totally going to butcher, but essentially it's saying fame and blame, pain and pleasure, loss and joy. These are all part of the, your human experience. And so the Gita is sort of saying, just like the Buddha, which I just butchered that passage, but essentially look at the higher perspective or like Christ sort of saying like, um, why do you worry so much about everything? All these, I, he wouldn't say first world problems, but I'll say Western first world problems. Why are you worrying so much about this? What are you going to eat? What are you going to wear? Look at the birds of the field. Are they not fed? Look at the flowers. Do they not, do they not blossom and then go away in an instant and the grass is burned up in a feet like a moment. And don't you think that, um, God would watch over you even more and understand. So I think it, I think uh, in our human ego tyranny in, a, in and of ourselves, and unfortunately sometimes uh, egos are governing, governing us as well, <laughs> um, we're, we're, we're happening to, 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 um, to start narrowing our perspective of life to um, we are the center of the universe um, and um, kind of trying to push our will around instead of understanding and taking some time to reflect on what's what's occurring and i i can see it um since the beginning uh since the beginning of the of the crisis uh in the u.s well it was way before yeah uh it but in since march when they shut down most states shut down here in in march uh that uh people have been having lots of difficulties and sort of going to a base stress response um for a lot of people that's eating and drinking more or using drugs and alcohol or um, in the U S we have this new drug called Netflix and, you, and it's all around the world now. I'm just joking, but you, you can watch all of these stories, right. And, and escape, which is not bad. Right. Um, and, and other people have thought, well, I think what we need to do is um, uh, we all need to figure out our, our true path and we need to redecorate our house and we need to, you know, other people are protesting. So people are, are finding both, uh, you know, outlets that are non-destructive and destructive outlets with this crisis. And so um, I do believe that the Gita and what you were saying has a lot to teach us about how do we suffer? We're going to suffer regardless. If we're born, we're going to suffer. So how do we do that? Yes, and uh, I like what you're saying. And uh, um, let me read another verse here that that that, that, that gives you a, a different flavor from this uh, dazzling array of of, uh, of tools that with uh, the, the the Gita is, is a toolbox, and so just to, to give you a flavor of uh, all right, uh, okay, so I'm not the body, I'm not the mind. You be do uh, you may realize it. I'm not there yet, and the mortgage is due, and I'm out of a job, or I'm, I'm stressful and uh, free from, from my life. What what do I do now? How do I get to that point? Even if I accept that this is a worthwhile uh, and so here's a verse that that typifies this whole six uh, first ch six chapters of the um, uh, path of of action of how to work in the world um, and so it says you have the right to work O prince but not to the fruits this work breeds never work for fruits of your labor nor to laziness ever concede 
such beauty within these uh, words. Here is something that's completely first base stuff, right? Uh, um, we're here. We have to work, work in the, the big uh, context, both uh, making up our bed and then uh, uh, making breakfast for the kids uh, or uh, working for our, our livelihood. You have the right to work, O oh Prince, but not to the fruits this work breeds. Never work for fruits of your labor, nor to laziness ever conceive. Abandon clinging to, uh, uh, to your work's results. Act always heart united with the divine. True yoga is the art of maintaining in success and failure and even mind. So basically saying, look, um, uh, don't think of this, uh, uh, of, of today, uh, of the crisis as something that we have to just, uh, um, uh, you know, hold our heads above the water and get through it. And then we'll, we'll do spiritual work. This is spiritual work. It's here and now. Uh, uh, every action, everything we do, uh, every work uh, job, uh, day job, uh, work day, uh, or family chores uh, is an opportunity to practice this. Such such a sublime and, and difficult and challenging uh, 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 task. You have the right to work, O oh Prince, but not to the uh, fruits this work breeds. Can we even imagine uh, something like this? Everything we work for, we work for its fruits. This is how we're conditioned. This is the change that uh, uh, we're invited to start in baby steps uh, on the way to becoming a Beethoven or an Einstein. You start with uh, scales. You start with uh, uh, algebra. And so our algebra, our scales of the piano are the daily work. Uh, trying to do so uh, more focused on the present, less obsessed with the work results. And, and the virus is a great gift in that uh, regard because, hey, guess what? You can obsess about the future as much as you want or plan and out the window it goes for, thing, for, for things that are out of your control. What are you going to do? Uh, and so um, live your life uh, do your work as uh, first he, he says as as a, um, um, a, a, as a something that you have the right to do, but not owning the the, the results. And then there's an even an invitation to do your work as a prayer um, to what to that which you believe in, um, whatever that shape that uh, that may take. And so. Um, even uh, cutting tomatoes for your salad becomes uh, sacred, becomes a, a way into sanity. Um, uh, watch your Netflix, this is fine, uh, but, uh, but do so in an aware, in an aware manner. Uh, I'm not this body, I'm not this mind, I'm going through my day, I'm trying to think of others and not just of, uh, of myself. How can I be of service and not just what will please me uh, 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 to do so? And trying not to numb ourselves to, uh, to sleep, but to awaken through uh, every day that we live. Beautiful. Um, just to tie in some, some uh, psychology, Coral Jung um, said, I don't have this in front of me, something like, uh, most people go through their lives sleepwalking and only are on autopilot, I think, what he, and then only for a few moments awaken and then go back to sleep again. And I think that's the invitation. And one of the, well, I grew up in the Western culture and even more so um, when I was young, I was told that um, belief in certain principles of the orthodoxy of Christianity was the point and not the practice of it because the practice doesn't matter as much as being part of the club. That was the message I got. Um, and so that it took me a long time to break out of that, of that mindset and to understand that the practice is what it's about. And then getting even more is so difficult. If you've been trained this way, I through yoga and meditation for years, um, Thank goodness at my university, they had free yoga classes everywhere um, and, and meditation classes and whatnot. And they were, you know, secular or gym based. And they had a few people reading Sanskrit or whatever here and there, a couple of the teachers. But it, to, to really try to be mindful in the moment 
was a challenge because of all the messages, um, whether it's in the media, back then it was television, the internet wasn't really popular back then yet, and um, of of consumerism and, you know, plans. And so I, I found it difficult. Um, but two observations I, I will say is that since the virus started, time has seemed to slow down and, and it, in a good way. Yeah. Uh, and I, I don't, I, part of me didn't like it, of course. And a part of me is, is loving it. Part of me felt oppressed because I felt that I had to learn everything over. I have to wear a mask. I have to wash my hands more. I can't touch my face. I touch my face all the time. I'm a chronic face toucher. I got to stop that. I got to give up that addiction. I need to stand away from people and find my little group, my little uh, COVID-19 tribe where we can actually hang out. And who is that group going to be? And how do I do that responsibly? And how do I report in, you know, I, I run an office here. We have temperature guns, we have masks, we have all this stuff. So how do I do that? Every day I'm learning something new and I'm like, oh my goodness, I can't, this is so much, but yet it brought me so much into the moment where I started going, wait a minute, this is an opportunity. And, and what I've, what I've noticed is it's brought me more into playing with my dog. It's brought me more into conversation with my wife. I've, I've sh- sh- uh, shrunk my circles. Uh, uh, of friends that I speak to and not in a bad way, just I'm really more in deep conversation with multiple friends. Um, and so I, I think it can be an opportunity if, if we don't look at it with this Western progress attitude of, well, I can't wait to get through this so we can go back to normal. And of course, yeah. um, Greenpeace and other people that I follow are saying, uh, or, or their organizations are saying, um, we don't want to go back to that normal. We want a, a normal that's more equitable for all beings on this planet. And there's many ways to get there. Um, and then, so I'm, I'm happy about that. And I, and I, and I'm, I'm sad about everyone's suffering who's getting the virus. I, I had a friend who passed away from it in March and I've had three friends in the ICU. And then I have to, in the, in the U S it's, it's, there's a prominent conspiracy theory that it's not true until it happens to you. But anyway, so that's sort of infuriating. Lots of emotions, lots of emotions coming up. Um, luckily my three friends are now recovered, uh, or mostly recovered. I should say not completely. Um, but it, it's a real thing. And, and I think it's touching people's lives in so many ways, but because of the, uh, well, at least formally slow spread in the Northern part, well, in the Northern part of the United States, it's sort of slowly spreading in the South, it's spreading like wildfire. But because of that, it doesn't always hit everyone's life in a real way, except for the inconvenience. Yeah. And so I've been telling two last comments. I've been trying to tell people, use it as an opportunity these regulations are not an imp- uh, oppression. They are an inconvenience to save someone's life that you'll never meet. And to take and by taking care of yourself and your health, you are actually taking care of other people out there that you don't know. Um, yeah. And number two, this is just a fun comment uh, about uh, the Western mindset and something you said earlier: um, of the planning, you know, and the and the and the, and the trying to get it our way instead of surrendering to what is happening in the moment and having a process. There's a quote, I don't know who said it, but they said, uh, when a man makes plans, God laughs. So yeah, Yeah. I don't know who said that, but no, that's, uh, uh, that's uh, lovely. Uh, And uh, I, I I join very much what you're saying. And I think that the, this is a great uh, opportunity. Every moment in life is an opportunity, but uh, this is on a global scale unprecedented uh, for us. Uh, it will um, uh, go away and uh, it will, um, um, uh, with um, uh, whatever uh, transformation into the new normal, whatever that may be, but uh, the current phase is a gift which we should uh, cherish and utilize. Uh, soon enough, sooner or later, we will be back to rushing and then the uh, busy, uh, uh, being busy bodies. Uh, and so while time is slowing now, while we're in danger and so are attuned to our mortality, to the finality of life, to the uncertainty of life, to the unknown, uh, the great uh, unknown, uh, the, these are all um, uh, the ultimate settings. This is why the Gita was written as the Gita. Uh, at the, uh, uh, where When you're uh, facing a battlefield, you have zero tolerance for BS. Um, you want, uh, you have zero tolerance for philosophy as uh, in, in uh, the context of, of theories. Uh, and so uh, uh, this is the, the, the global mindset that we're putting right now is, uh, is a, a, a wonderful opportunity for a, 
uh, for growth. Let me perhaps uh, read a, a few uh, uh, last verses uh, that give a, a tasting of uh, the, the third element of the Gita. It's, it's part of this chapter on um, yoga of meditation. Uh, meditation and mindfulness, many of us uh, have tasted or practiced in some shape or form. Gita is the uh, uh, is the uh, uh, the essence of uh, um, uh, of meditation, and uh, so uh, uh, here goes. Um, so it says, "Yoga parts us from pain, O oh Prince. Pain we thought would always be there. Practice it, therefore, determined." Be joyful and never despair. Yoga here, not in the sense just of the physical yoga, but the, the overall, the, the culminate, the all paths of inner journey. Utterly abandon desires, Prince. Know they all arise from your thought. The wild pack of senses restrain, discerning what's real from what's not. Patiently, O oh Prince, bit by bit, let one gradually calm one's mind. On divine inner self, focus inwards, not letting the mind wander round. Time after time, mind will stray, outward by senses drawn away. Time and again, it be withdrawn, focused on inner self alone. And then one last uh, uh, verse. Then does such purified heart know bliss that's beyond what senses can. Established in this reality, never to wander again. So it gives us a, a flavor of both what meditation is about. Uh, and here in the context of, context of what we just spoke, uh, uh, Paul, uh, of meditation in the worldly aspect of it, of daily life. As you're going through your routine uh, and you've made your resolutions, I want to be more mindful, I want to be happy, to content with what I have, I want to uh, try and uh, live less in my uh, fears and judgments and then the anxieties and more in serving. And then, the, uh, as the Gita says, time and again, mind will stray outward by senses drawn away. We will be drawn by the next chocolate or Netflix or uh, gossip or a uh, um, uh, thought process. We're addict addicted to these uh, thought processes. Uh, time and again, mind will stray outward by senses drawn away. Time and again, it be withdrawn, focused on inner self alone. When we, we, as we uh, uh, find uh, and train ourselves to focus more inwardly, we feel what you've reported of finding greater peace, even within the turmoil, uh, in little things, in the friends, in the small circle of friends that we have, in family, in uh, love, in uh, work, but uh, from a less hectic and more grounded uh, place, uh, hopefully. Yes, that is very wise and beautiful. And I, I hope um, from hearing this that uh, listeners are excited to um, pick up your translation or any translation of the Bhagavad Gita, but I, I, I recommend Isaac's translation. So that's just a little thing on my show, but, uh, and, and try to try to have a practice. I do love the simplicity of the poetry because it speaks to the way our mind works, which goes to show you that modern psychology doesn't have everything figured out, which is probably why they're going towards mind body work. Now that's the new trend yep. and uh, taking the ego out of it and all of that. But um, it's, it's got that simplicity and it's a reminder. And I think we all need reminding uh, daily. I, I need reminding multiple hundreds of times a day. <laughs> so that's, that, that's it. listen. This is what is so uplifting about this uh, scripture, and it re it is really a guide for life, and and the one which uh, is uh, meant for uh, to be at your bedside and to have a, a verse be pulled uh, um, uh, on a daily basis or whenever um, the need uh, strikes you or inspiration uh, strikes you, and, and different tools that help us uh, get through the. Um, uh, through the day. Wonderful. Um, I, I, I don't have too much else except I, I was struck. I wanted to point out to the listeners that uh, it seems like that Martin Luther King 
Jr. in the United States was actually inspired by the Gita and a lot of the nonviolence, as was Nelson Mandela. And I found that useful, especially in the United States, as we are um, working on reforming um, the relations and also how our city uh, police uh, and municipalities and social programs treat people. So um, I find that hopefully that can contribute. Yeah, the, uh, look, the, the, uh, just to, to add to what you're saying, the, the, uh, the great uh, the civic rights movements, uh, you mentioned Nelson Mandela and uh, Martin, uh, Martin Luther King uh, Jr. Um, 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 Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, says that he was, he said he was inspired by uh, Gandhi's uh, movement and, uh, and viewed that uh, nonviolence uh, as the, the basis for uh, the civic rights movement in the, in the U.S. Nelson Mandela actually uh, um, read the Gita in his prison cell and says that that's what kept him alive. Um, uh, Gandhi uh, attributes everything that he has ever done uh, to the Gita. When you're in San Francisco on the uh, on the pier, there's a, a statue of of, uh, uh, of uh, Gandhi walking the pier with a quote by Einstein, which I really find uh, moving. Uh, Generations to come will scarce believe uh, one such as this in um, flesh and blood has walked the earth. Um, and so uh, this uh, giant uh, uh, Gandhi uh, that uh, set all of this in motion, everything that we know about civil uh, uh, rights uh, uh, ties back to this uh, humble man. And he says, it's all the Gita. Uh, this is, uh, he says, my life is about the Gita. The movement is driven by uh, uh, the Gita. And it's not uh, uh, about nonviolence as much as it is about seeking truth. He called it satyagraha, the adhering to truth, truth being that inner self, uh, which allows us in times of turmoil right now. Uh, uh, this is not a, a lecture in the history of, of uh, uh, civil rights. Uh, these are very uh, practical uh, um, lessons for us here and now. With the social divide, with this extreme uh, um, tears in the society and threat to democracy and, and all of that, being able, as Gandhi and Martin Luther King has, have, have inspired us, to see everyone as human beings, the opponent. As, as human beings. And so it's not just the coin of, okay, let's do this non-violent. Or, uh, this, uh, uh, there's something much deeper than that. It can only be not non-violent, truly, uh, as much as you inquire and we inquire, which each inquire inside and connect to that spirit within, which is common to everyone. And then there is no aggressor and uh, and, and the grieved, uh, uh, or, or there is a unity that, that brings them together to transcend the, uh, this and to... Uh, um, so this is not utopian, but actually very, uh, very relevant and very difficult tasks. And so texts like the Gita hopefully can be of help. Yes, I think um, during this time of change, we will need a lot of help and a lot of uh, wisdom and centering because especially people trying to make change, the power structures are not usually in favor of changing the status quo. So um, if anybody's out there who's trying to make change, you, we do, you do need a guidepost and a center to go back to and, and the Gita helps you get back to your own. Um, and so, yes, I love it. Uh, I don't really have any more comments to, because I think you've just laid it out beautifully and I think people need to go read it and experience themselves. Is there any advice you have to any listener who uh, is wondering, how do I read the Gita? What should I do? I'm a little lost, kind of like, kind of like the prince. <laughs> maybe. Uh, we, we, the, the, uh, I, my advice uh, um, 
Um, the, the, the book itself is, is accessible. This uh, specific translation, as well as other translations, uh, go look them up on the internet. The, the, uh, this specific translation, once again, is a Gita, a timeless guide for our time, and it is available in, uh, on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and all of the other uh, outlets, and is available in book form, in audio book, and the uh, and the ebook, uh, the advice uh, uh, on a very personal uh, level: read it, if you may, as an autobiography, as your autobiography. Uh, it is a book that's written eye level uh, for each and every one of us, uh, not as some historic uh, manifesto, but as something that uh, simply echoes truth that, that you already know and uh, an, an inner dialogue which you're already having with your uh, uh, inner self. And, uh, um, and, and uh, read it uh, um, slowly, uh, a, a verse a day, uh, a chapter a week, um, or uh, what I found useful is, is repeating the same chapter every, every day of, of the week. It, it only takes a few minutes. Uh, it's very a small book, deceivingly small. In this translation, I've also tried to make it uh, accessible. And so at the beginning of every chapter, there's a small introduction. So it's not this intimidating thing of, oh, should I go and study philosophy or this is complex? No, it's, it's uh, the prince is the prince. Uh, each one of us is the prince or princess of the Gita. And we're invited to this uh, inner journey, which is our life. Great. I'm hoping people listen to that part. Uh, I'm going to try to actually reread it a lot slower because um, I was speeding through it, but I loved it. So um, thank you so much for your time, uh, Dr. Isaac Bentwich. And it's just been a pleasure and uh, to have you on the show. And I could see the, uh, the sunshine coming or the sunset coming in on your face and it looked very nice. Uh, so I'm hoping you're enjoying it and staying safe there in Israel. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. And then the, uh, um, one of the good things about these uh, difficult times is that it is bringing us uh, together. And so to all of my brothers and sisters in America, um, uh, we are all in this uh, uh, together and uh, let us say, uh, um, uh, grow and pass this uh, safely, uh, keeping our safety of health and, and uh, attending to the physical needs and uh, uh, hopefully uh, better and easier times will come soon. Let us make the most of these difficult times before they go away. Um, now is our time for growth. So thank you for having me, Paul. So I enjoyed the discussion. Thank you so much. have it. This has been another episode of the Intentional Clinician Podcast. If you've been enjoying it, please share it with people you know. I would surely appreciate it. And if you haven't already, subscribe or give us a rating on iTunes. Until next time, I'm wishing you all a safe and peaceful week. If you are looking for an Emdria consultant, I am now an Emdria consultant in training. And I can provide 15 of the 20 hours needed to become Emdria certified. I'm going to be starting an Emdria consultation group, both online and in person. It is looking more like October to December 2020. For details, check out counselingsupervisorgr.com or healthforlifegr.com or email me. 
The Michigan Mental Health Counselors Association is working to increase the availability of quality mental health services statewide, increasing education, promoting best practices, and working to keep licensed professional counselors and other professionals accessible by the public. They are currently working with the American Mental Health Counselors Association in attempting to get licensed professional counselors finally covered by Medicare, which would help a lot of people out there that are on Medicare right now and cannot see a counselor. They can only see a psychologist or a social worker, which means that people are not getting the care they need. Also, we are working to integrate into schools and try to get more health out there. I know a lot of people are talking about different ways to change the police department and get mental health um, responders uh, to be going to the calls. And I think this is something we should be working on on a legislative Uh, place to be able to help our communities by getting first responders who are mental health experts. The recording you just listened to consists of the personal opinions of Paul Krauss and his guest, and while these are based upon the literature they have read and their experience in the field, they should not be viewed as the definitive opinion on the subject. Listening to this podcast is not a substitute for treatment. If you are in crisis, please dial 911 or the National Suicide Prevention Hotline at 1-800-273-8255. Are you a young person of color feeling down, stressed, or overwhelmed? Text the word STEVE, S-T-E-V-E, to 741 741- 741. That's Steve to 741741, and a live trained crisis counselor will respond to you. If you are in need of counseling, do not hesitate to make an appointment with a local counselor in your area. You can also make an appointment with the excellent clinicians in the Grand Rapids, Michigan area at Health for Life Grand Rapids and the Trauma Informed Counseling Center of Grand Rapids by visiting www.healthforlifegr.com or give us a call at 616 200 4433. Also, thanks to the secure online platforms that we now have access to and the changes of insurance companies due to COVID-19, anyone in the state of Michigan can work with us online if they have a need and it works out. So you can also utilize your insurance or self-pay, whatever works for you. We'd be glad to help you. All right. Thanks for listening.
Thank you.